nothing fucks with me more, meaning I get excited about, yeah. when someone wins a five set match, yeah, that they were down 0-2. It could be second round French Open, and I'll, just, I'll get home from work and just see what happened, yeah. and I'll see somebody won a five set match, yeah. but they lost the first two sets, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, she or he is fucking fired. Yeah. Welcome to Hanakuma's Good Trouble, where we celebrate those who have the courage to disrupt the norm. I'm Nick Kyrgios, professional tennis player and your host. In each episode, we'll sit down with game changers who aren't afraid to rock the boat. We'll dig into their stories and the waves they've made in their worlds for the better. Welcome to Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. Today, we speak with a man who isn't living rent-free in all of our heads. He's the damn landlord. This serial entrepreneur's immigrant story is like a movie. From slanging ice at the family liquor store to owning and rebranding it, wine library, the multi-million dollar enterprise and beginnings of his media empire. Gary Vaynerchuk, AKA Gary V, a single nickname synonymous with success, is new media, where he holds court, serving game, all aces. Amidst your whirlwind of wins and digital domination, what does good trouble mean to you? First of all, thank you, my man, good stuff. Um, I think good trouble is important. I think it's how we advance the world. I think good trouble means to me finding new ways to accept people under new norms. In the arena I play in, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, there's no way to succeed without causing it. You know, if you're not causing good trouble, it means you're an employee. Yeah, what three words would you describe, like your youth, your upbringing, like you as a person, who you are today? My mom dominated. (laughs) You know, when I think about my childhood, I'm the byproduct of tremendous parenting. Mm. You know, for the first 14 years of my life, that was my mom. My dad worked at his liquor store every hour. I barely saw him. And then from 14 to 22, I got to spend a lot of time with my dad and learn some really good, you know, old world principles that I think make me me. And so, to answer you more directly in the way I think you're asking, um, competitive. You know, it's fun to talk to a professional athlete about this. I believe we're, we've really lost our way with competition and parenting. Yep. These eighth place trophies, no. telling a kid that's crying when he loses, this doesn't matter, it's just a game. I think modern parenting has lost our way. From six to 15, I barely remember anything other than competing. Backyard football, tennis, darts. Anything, any, video, anytime we lost, every, I felt like shit the whole day. I wanted to redo it, go again. I believe anyone that's achieved things as a parent, as a professional, as an athlete, as a business person, I think normally, if they've achieved big, they're normally the kid that cried when they lost or struggled with it because they cared. I think indifference is a pandemic. Mm. It doesn't matter, chill, indifference is a problem. And I think when you tell a kid everybody wins, you're teaching indifference, it's not real life. So I think competition, then I think entrepreneurship, like it would snow in New Jersey when I was eight and every kid went out with a sled and was fired up to make a snowman and I grabbed a shovel from my garage and was ringing doorbells and was looking to shovel your driveway for three bucks. It was just selling something. It was very entrepreneurial and then just joyful. Mm. You know, I think an important thing I think a lot about is who are the people that are luckiest in their circumstance with their upbringing. And I've come to a place at 48 now where I think a child who grows up in a family that is happy and doesn't have a lot, she or he is set up for massive success. Because from the get, they're taught that there's not a correlation between money and happiness. And so I grew up that way with very humble beginnings, but my mom was sunshine, everything was good, always, even when it was a struggle. Like it was just all happy, love, unconditional love, and that set me up. Well, I have a direct quote from you. I was a kid, I had the best mom of all time, and everything was rainbows, but we were poor as fuck. <laughs> yes. It's so like, I was reading through all your quotes, and I was like, it went, me, me too, like I didn't have you know, a lot, but I just had the best childhood. Like I only knew that my parents made me so happy, and I was playing tennis, and they gave me all these opportunities, but then I realized, looking back, I'm like, we really didn't have that much. They just made same, the most of everything. Same, same. T- I was only in my 30s where I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Like, they stopped buying me shit at like 11. Like, like, it was just, it was my norm. That's what allows people like you and I and the many that are watching that are doing it in their fields, professions, lives, the courage to do shit. When I see what you do, I don't look at it as like ridiculous or flashy. No, I see it as courage. Yeah. And I think it's fun to 
ask why. Yeah, I mean, uh, my entire childhood and playing tennis, I was always asking coaches, why am I doing this? And I'm playing these shots under pressure where everyone's like, why is he doing that? He's got no discipline. He's not like thinking straight out there. And I'm only playing this because in the moment it feels right to me. And then I look at all these kids that are trying to play this way. And it's inspiring for me. Like, it's like a lot of kids are watching me play and they're enjoying it and they're happy. And then... And they make their version of it. Yeah. You know, you were affected by the people that you saw on the come up. Yeah. We're affected by what we see. Mm. And so like everybody that you watched in whatever capacity you watch, that's affecting you. And you are now affecting them. And I view it because I see the world, I think, more similar to you. I see it as courageous and curious. But I also think it's encouraging. I mean, especially your Wimbledon run, it was fun for me because I've been watching for a long time. And obviously you hit more of the public consciousness with that. People immediately loved you, immediately disliked you. It allowed me at a lot of drinks and dinner tables and around friends and acquaintances to talk about the power of curiosity, the power of why, the courage of not being scared to break out, especially when it's silly ass shit. In a world where there's real shit going on, is a red fucking hat that serious? (laughs) And I'll use tennis terms the Agassi of it all, the McEnroe of it all, the Connors of it all. I think they underestimate the importance of those people and what they do to create new conversations. And I think that's powerful. Yeah, well, I mean, if everyone everyone was did the same and acted the same, then no one, first of all, no one would watch, but there wouldn't be, you know, growing fans, youthful fans, like, I'm not relatable to, like, Federer, only a couple people are relatable to Federer. I was never, I never looked at him as like, I want to be that guy. I knew it wasn't attainable. I don't want to get canceled in the tennis community, so I'm just going to skip this part, but I get it. No, no, I'm joking. I'm not, I I mean, (laughs) I want this on film. Me too. Yeah. It's easy to respect Raj. Yeah. I understand what he did. I understand why people love him. I know he's a good dude. Yeah. But I don't like it. Yeah. This is why I fuck with you so much. What you do on the court is what I did on the stage. Mm. In 2009, when I started public speaking, all the biggest speaking bureaus in the world reached out to me and said, if you start wearing a suit instead of being so casual, and if you stop cursing, you will become one of the biggest speakers in the world. And again, going back to the title, Good Trouble, one may see me in 2009 cursing and wearing casual Mm -hmm. in business environments on stage as trouble, but I saw it as good trouble. And what I mean by that was I'm incapable of being anybody but myself. It wasn't a very complicated conversation. I'm a businessman. These are multiple individuals telling me that I will be able to do more business Mm -hmm. if I compromise on these two things. What's crazy is 99% of things for me are easy to compromise on. I don't have conviction about them. I don't care about them. But if I care, I don't know how not to. Do you feel like, you know, when you go up on stage and you're wearing what you want to wear, you're going about things the way you want to go about them, like, do you feel like you, you got punished for that in any way? Do I believe that there was tons of people that are like, this guy's awesome, and put my video up and the boss looked at it and said, we're not hiring in that dude. I was getting punished without seeing it. Today, most people that give keynote speeches are pretty casual. Yeah. I mean, today, when people wear a business suit to a business meeting, they usually make a joke about it because now that seems out of range. For me, of course I was being punished. I was missing out on tons of opportunities that the 2009 business world made decisions on, Mm. but I couldn't see it the way you can see it because I wasn't in an organization, a company, a part of a tour. Well, I still don't say it that way. I still do whatever anyway. Well, Well, that goes back to just being happy. I don't understand why anyone deem success anything other than finding as much happiness as often as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and that comes in many forms. Unfortunately, I think modern society looks at success through a lens of finances. So when you entered the world of social media, it would have been a big change for you. And you know, you, do you have someone that you like modeled or did you ever look up to someone or did you just do it on your own? When I look at the way I communicate on stage, I can see the Chris Rock and Randy the Macho Man Savage of it all in the way that I talk. The wrestler I loved, the comedian (laughs) that I loved. So I think I have a cadence of communication style that was affected by others. But no, I think people learn different ways. You know, we see people come along that look very similar to the person that's got it right now with a little tweak. Mm -hmm. I think that's great, that works for them. I also had the luxury of not thinking that I was a personality or a personal brand. When I started making content, the concept of people being famous from the internet was foreign. So I was just talking about my truth. 
I wasn't thinking in the forms of the way every kid now thinks at mm-hmm. 15, like I could be famous because of this. For me it was, I just wanna say certain things first about wine, yep. then about business, then about life. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing really to look towards when I was doing it. I started YouTube videos eight weeks after YouTube was launched. There was nothing to look at. Mm. There was no Mr. Beast or Logan Paul or me or you. There was just nothing to look at. There was mainstream celebrity, but that wasn't what you saw on the internet. That was all polished and fakish. This started the era of potentially more real, though I've learned humans are humans. Most of what's on social is not real either now because people know people are watching. But that 2006 to 2010 era was amazing Mm. because People weren't thinking about people watching them yeah, that way. They were just doing it. They were just doing it. Yep. So I've seen multiple clips of you saying that no one works harder than you. And I've seen that, that clip, the guy was like, how do you know that? Was, you're just like, I know it's not possible. And I believe that. I'm not gonna sit here and say I work as hard as you. I probably don't. Um, but when did you realize that you had something that most, most people don't? I don't view it as like, I work 19 hours and you work 15. Yep. I think of it as like just the pure intent and the effort in every moment. There's plenty of people on earth that work more hours than me. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of people that work the way I work. I'm looking at some of them right now <laughs> behind the cameras that are 100 when they work. Yep. As somebody who was in school and gave 2% effort and everything was everything but what was going on, mm. in work, it's 100. Yep. I'm like unreachable for 10 hours a day. Every you. minute is booked. But it's not even about being booked. It's, it's like when you lock in in a big match. Yep. You can't even hear it. Yeah, you can't. You, you can't, anything. and that's how I am every moment that I work because I love it. Mm. Look, I'm from immigrant parents who worked every minute. My mom raised three kids. I never saw someone helping ever. Yeah. I didn't know what a, a house cleaner was. I didn't know what a babysitter <laughs> was. I didn't know what a cook was, a driver. I never even heard of that shit. Yeah. There was no such thing. I don't even know what we're talking about. So I watched two people in front of me work every minute Mm. to build a family, to build a life. And then I was 14 and I'm working in my dad's store Mm -hmm. on some child labor shit. Don't arrest pops, I (laughs) think. Statue of legislations, you can't get to him. I was working 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours. So I'm just built. It's like training. Yeah, what does it mean for you to be part of, you know, immigrant success and for, you know, people out there who have found refuge and what, what would you say to them to get stability and to put them on the right path? I would say, real talk, I think it's an advantage. I think we lived through a long time where we were like, oh, if you're an immigrant, that's a disadvantage. I think we're in the era now where we're starting to realize it's the reverse. An immigrant mentality, including if you're not an immigrant and you just happen to be born where you're born but you got the immigrant mentality, means just a couple things. You're willing to eat shit, you're willing to be patient, you're willing to have humility, and you're willing to put in the work. So what would I say to all of them? I would say, congrats, you're lucky you've been put in a situation where you're gonna have to do all the things I just said, and those are pillars, Mm -hmm. foundational blocks to not only success, but true happiness, which is the ultimate success. I believe I was lucky Mm -hmm. to be born in the Soviet Union and come to America at three and not have stuff, because that not have stuff was foundational in what transpired, not just having stuff, but who I am. Stuff. Yep. Exactly. Sure. Look, I think we're in the era where being an immigrant is the blessing. I really believe that. I still to this day would argue that I try too hard to stay in the dirt. Like, I don't put driver or private or stuff mm. on a pedestal. I put the process on a pedestal. I put kindness and civility to other human beings on a pedestal. Yep. I'm not confused why people want things. Mm. I just don't think my life is better. I think my time is more efficient. Yep. But I don't need anything. I feel the same way, I don't need anything. Like sitting here interviewing you and talking with you is never thought that would be happening. And it's just, yeah, I, I resonate with it a lot. Let me ask you a question just yep. as we chop it up because since I do a podcast, I know how to do it too. Yep. <laughs> like on that note, I believe that most people need stuff for other people, yep. not themselves. Yep. I actually think deep down, none of us need anything else. Mm-hmm. Like you need a little bit of love in your life. Obviously you need a roof over your head and some yeah. food. Basics. But, like, but I, basics. 
do you think that shifted for you once you got something or was that always the consistent jam as well? Well, the thing is when I was young, I, I had everything I needed. Like my parents always made sure I was, you know, fed. I had a roof in my head. I, at 13, 14, I was traveling to Philippines, some of these, you know, third world countries. And I was seeing, you know, people come up to me and beg. And at a, as a young kid for me, that was really eye opening. And that's what, you know, Kobe said, this is what he loves about tennis is you grow, you have to grow up really quickly and independently. Yes. So I saw that. And I knew that I had a lot straight off the back. Every time I flew back to Australia, I was like, wow, Australia is a be- beautiful yeah. place. And I feel like most people don't know that. And now, you know, I sit here with, you know, Jordans on and I, I'm dressing fresh and I don't need anything <laughs> else. Do you know what I mean? So The dressing fresh you need. It, I, I need, I, of course. Yeah, I feel of course. But that leads to my next question. <laughs> like, you've got so much going on. Yes. And like, how do you balance that with like your normal life? Kids yeah, and of like, course. you know, like, how do, how do you do that? Um, by not overjudging myself. There is work-life balance, but it's individual. Yep. For every one of the people that are watching and listening, them, today. And then in a year, it changes again. Hmm. And then in six months, it changes again. Life moves. So I'm not trying to achieve work-life balance based on the world's current definition of it. I just want to make the people I love as happy as possible to the best of my ability. Mm-hmm. But I also know that if I don't make myself happy, it's game over. Well, uh, interesting you said this because I did, um, you know, I spoke with Jay Shetty and he said that if you don't have time to recharge yourself, you can't make the other people around you, you know, happy at all. The number one observation I know, and I have a family that's pretty unique. I have plenty of family members that are super, super optimistic and happy and plenty of close family members who are incredibly cynical and there is just one through line on it all. Whoever likes themselves most is given sunshine and whoever doesn't like themselves most is given darkness and so, A lot of times people try to do nice by others and don't realize that they're building resentment toward those people, which then flips and then they start going dark. You have to be in a place where you're looking at yourself. The other thing is most people listening and watching are not gracious enough to themselves. Every one of us in this room and everyone listening is good at stuff and not good at stuff. And why we choose what we put on a pedestal and not, when people are like, you're the great, I'm like, I'm a good businessman, I'm happy, I get it. I'm a good businessman, but still, and? Yeah. Like, let's play it out. You and I live a unique life where we are, going, we are publicly known. Yep. And one day, unfortunately, it's gonna be a wrap. Yes. And what's gonna happen? We're gonna get 24 hours, if we're lucky, on some love, on whatever family. social media is on that. Our, our family will care more for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're gonna be dead forever, and you weren't born, for a long time. And so in this little window that all of us have, why not try to fight for enjoyment? Mm. And, I'm, and I, I'm very passionate about that. For me, I'm just like, I never thought I'd reach this level of happiness through what I went through. And especially the last couple of years, like obviously my dark period, but now I never thought it was possible. Did you ever think you would have reached a point of this, like knowing all this at any point of your life when you were younger? Did you ever think you were gonna be sitting here feeling this way? Yes. There was never a time I didn't feel that I would be feeling like this. My mom lost her mom at five. My dad lost his dad at 15. I would argue that the majority of my childhood, I was scared my parents were gonna die. And so every day I was just like grateful that nothing bad happened. It's all a bonus. Yeah, and so I think that I was just focused on really heavy shit as a young child. I don't think I've ever said this. I've never strived for happiness. It's just always been there. I've never had the perspective of like, one day I'll be happy. It's always been, I'll always be happy. I know you're into pickleball. Yes. And, uh, but that's not the question. So when you're gonna buy the Jets one yes. day, we know that. What's your first move to get the Lombardi trophy? I've been thinking about buying New York Jets since I was probably in third or fourth grade. That was about the time I realized I was unlikely to play for them. Cause up until that point, that was the dream. I'm gonna buy the team. And then the next day I'm gonna meet every person from the person that's been there for a week, that's in concessions at the stadium, to the person drafting and the general manager, and I'm gonna meet every single person. I'll do what I've done for the last 55 years professionally, which is audit the human beings that I'm around and understand are they good at the craft, but more importantly, are they good in their soul? And I'm going to make decisions based on that audit and then make some changes inevitably, build some people up that I see something in that are not in the best place and double down on the people that I think are wonderful already and build the most epic human-based capable 
football organization in the world and that will directly correlate in us winning a Super Bowl. I'm not even sure if I'm gonna be happy when I buy them. Yep. Chasing them is everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the enjoyment I have right this second, thinking about it, trying it, the business call I had in the parking lot before I walked in that's <laughs> important. Yeah. Like it's all little pieces to get there, but I weirdly think when I get there, it's gonna, gonna like, oh. yeah, I'm already like worried about it, but it's, it's the chase. Mm. It's always been the chase for me. One of the things I'm trying to work on at 48 years old is actually enjoying the wins. We'll be on something for like two, three years. Yeah. It happens. And then you just move on. And like, we're not even there for like a second. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, yo, what, can, can, we, yeah. can, can we have at least a <laughs> sip of champagne? Fuck a party, just a sip? I'm like, no. I didn't do it for the trophy. Yep. I did it to get to the trophy. And for me, buying the Jets or other things I've accomplished, that's the trophy. It's really the worst part of it. Like, I love the dirt. I love the grind. Mm. I love it. It's why I think I like tennis so much, especially a five set match. It really, to me, correlates to life. Yeah. Like, because you're trying, you're trying. The other person got it. They figured it out. They watched tape. They remember from the last match. Plus on the tour, some of that shit's carrying over from other oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, somebody you've smacked forever comes out, wins the first two sets. They saw something when you were smacking them two yeah. months ago in the third set and finished them off, but they saw something and they were able to come out the gate. And now you have to think on your feet because there's no hiding. This is why I love sports. There's no hiding. Yeah, especially in tennis, you can't stop out either. Yeah, people call out sick at work when they're fucked up. When you're down 2-0, there's no calling out sick. You can retire and people do that shit too. And I always judge that different. You know, a little fake injury instead of losing. <laughs> That's a whole different game. Yeah. But I, I, really, I really do think there's a tremendous correlation to a five-set match in life. It feels there's no better feeling. You come off the court and you're like, fuck, I was getting smashed and I had no way out. And then you find a way to like turn it around and you can feel the momentum, like you feel like you're getting on top of someone, like you figured him out, and you figure it out by the third set, and you're just like, oh, I've, I've, I'm coming, and then you win it, it's the best feeling ever. And this is like something inspirational for everybody. They could be looking at us and thinking, I wanna be there one day, mm -hmm. and they might be not in a great place. And for that kid and that person, that just means you're down two sets love. Yeah, it's not over. Good news, it's genuinely not over. Change a relationship, quit a job, break up with a boyfriend that maybe isn't bringing you that proper energy. Stop talking to your negative mom three times a day, maybe once a month. <laughs> All of us can make the hard decisions to tweak our shit to win the last three sets. Yep. Well, I guess that wraps up uh, another episode of Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. Thank you, Gary, for making time and I really do appreciate it. So, yeah, thank appreciate you so it. Much. Thank you, Proud of you. thank you, thank you. Thanks for watching. For more Hanakuma's Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.